Lady Anne Finch, the Countess of Winchelsea, is an interesting poet to study for a couple of reasons. She seems to stand upon the borders of one era of the Augustan age or the neoclassical age that really came to prominence at the end of the 17th century, which is where she's situated. But she also seems to look forward in much of her poetry to the Romantic era, that age of sensibility and of feeling and of, of reverie. Lady Anne Finch was born in 1661, so she became a poet in the age of Dryden and of Pope. This was the age of the Enlightenment or the age of reason, which was just beginning. But her poetry has this romantic vitality, this incisive specificity and movements of deep feeling that are characteristic of the Romantic Age. She's drawing upon Shakespeare, Milton, uh, some of the 17th century predecessors of hers, as we'll see in this poem, A Nocturnal Reverie. Now, a reverie was, according to John Locke, a dreamlike state. This is significant because in the age of reason and rationality and enlightenment, people are interested in the intellectual analytical faculties of the human mind, what can be grasped, what can be known empirically. But she turns to reverie, which John Locke defines as a state of mind when ideas float in and out of our mind without any reflection or regard of the understanding. It is that which the French call reverie. Our language has scarce a name for it. So Lady Anne Finch is using this word reverie to denote this state of mind that's very sensuous, but also not following a particular logical strain of thought. It's more reflective and infusing with the external landscape. Her poetry is looking forward to this conception of the poet as a private artistic figure that begins to emerge in the mid 18th century. We think of uh, Thomas Gray's Elegy written in a country churchyard published in 1751 in which the, the speaker of the poem is this isolated and withdrawn figure. We might also think of the late 18th century with the rise of romantic poets like William Wordsworth. Wordsworth actually really enjoyed Anne Finch's poetry. He said that she introduced new images of the external world. She's very important for the romantics like Wordsworth, uh, but she's very much rooted within this neoclassical mood all the same, drawing upon Shakespeare and to some extent Milton. The poem A Nocturnal Reverie begins, and I hope you've read this, by the way, before we do the analysis. Uh, literary analysis is no substitute for literary experience, so I hope you have read this slowly and out loud and allowed the language to come alive as you do. In such a night, when every louder wind is to its distant cavern safe confined, this immediately calls back to Shakespeare, this phrase, in such a night, which will be repeated uh, again here, and then finally a third time at the end. In such a night, it comes from the Merchant of Venice, the last act, act five, the first scene, where Lorenzo and Jessica are having a kind of contest of wit. Lorenzo, looking on the moon, says, the moon shines bright in such a night as this, when the sweet wind did gently kiss the trees, and they did make no noise. In such a night, Troilus, methinks, mounted the Trojan walls, and sighed his soul toward the Grecian tents where Crescent lay that night. And then Jessica returns, In such a night did this be fearfully or trip the dew, and saw the lion shadow air himself, and ran dismayed away. So they're imagining lovers within the night, within this great uh, canon of poetry. And Lorenzo retor returns, uh, and they go back and forth for a while until Stefano comes and interrupts him. And Jessica says, I would outnight you did nobody come, but hark, I hear the footman. So Anne Finch is entering into this tradition of imaginative reverie that's very much like Lorenzo and Jessica drawing upon an institution of poetry going all the way back to the Greeks. And here we have a reference of that kind. And only gentle Zephyr fans his wings, and lonely Philomel, still waking, sings. Zephyr being the god of the west wind, the wind that comes to awake the earth from its wintry sleep. And then the lonely Philomel, the tragic figure who, after being abused by her sister's husband, 
uh, sought revenge and took the form of a nightingale. And so she's hearing the nightingale and she has this classical illusion going back uh, to this larger canon of classical poetry. Again, it's the neoclassical age, so she's doing this, but it's almost as though she's just paying her homage and that she's now going to turn to more native scenes. Or from some tree famed for the owl's delight, she, hollowing clear, directs the wanderer right, she being the owl. And now we have this human figure, imagined of course, entering the scene, someone wondering, uh, almost like the mind itself wondering as the poem unfolds. Before we move on, the poem is all one sentence long. This is what's called syntactical extension. Syntax is merely the ordering of the subject and verb. It's the, it's the grammatical ordering of a sentence. And so uh, poets you'll see sometimes, especially poets like John Milton, will extend their syntax and withhold the verb and subject until the very end or keep it at the beginning and then have the rest unfurl after it. But it creates, in this sense, suspense. So we haven't had the main verb and the main subject yet. She's still piling on these overlapping dependent clauses. And she begins again. We have this anaphora, the repetition at the beginning of the line. In such a night, when passing clouds give place or thinly veil the heaven's mysterious face. A delicate personification going on here. The heaven's face being veiled by passing clouds when in some river overhung with green, and of course that phrase overhung with green, enacting the overhanging of the green by having that phrase at the very end of the line, overhanging until the next, the waving moon and the trembling leaves are seen. Notice just the musical interplay of the long and short vowels here, waving moon and the trembling leaves are seen in these internal sonic textures. Uh, it's just so rich, you have to read this poem aloud. When freshened grass now bears itself upright and makes cool banks to pleasing rest invite. Now notice how the night is being portrayed here as an hour of refreshment. The grass which had fainted in the hot sun now begins to rise up and makes cool banks to pleasing rest invite. Again, now we have the scene accommodating pleasure for a human experience. Uh, previously, except for the wanderer, we just had a landscape inhabited by animals, and now the landscape begins to portray itself as something inviting. Whence, or from where, whence springs the woodbind and the bramble rose, and where the sleepy cowslip sheltered grows, another very delicate personification. But notice what she's doing. Her illusions now are not neoclassical. They, they aren't going back to Rome or ancient Greece. They're made up of English native plants. She's placing us in a very particular native scene. Whilst now a paler hue, the foxglove, takes another flower. Yet checkers still with red, the dusky breaks when scattered glowworms but in twilight fine, show trivial beauties, watch their hour to shine. The inhabitants here are still female. We have the female owl, uh, but we also have glowworms, and the female glowworms are, are like larvae, and they go to the tips of grass, and they have a lamp on their bottoms, which they uh, light, and it gives a kind of phosphorescent glow, almost like a firefly. But notice the, the pictorial precision she has here. I mean, she's really creating a spectacle through her language. Yet checkers, still with red, the dusky breaks. Uh, this, is, this is getting close to what Wordsworth meant when he said that in Lady Anne Finch's poetry, there are new images of external nature. Just very tender and precise. The reverent and sustained gaze that she has is permeating through this, this reverie. Of course, we still haven't gotten to the main verb yet. And there's this syntactical withdrawing. It's almost like we're being nestled into this secluded space by virtue of not just the description and the beautiful sounds, but also the syntax. We're getting further and further away. It's just filling up. 
Whilst Salisbury stands the test of every light, in perfect charms and perfect virtue bright, the atmosphere and light are playing upon them, the meadows and the landscapes, when odors which declined repelling day through temperate air, uninterrupted stray, beautiful line, the odors straying, this image of scents on the wind, which were prohibited from straying during the day because of the hot sun, but now in the temperate air of night, they begin to rise up from the earth and move about, straying like this imagined wanderer in the beginning, but uninterrupted. And this is key, I think, this word uninterrupted, because the, the sentence itself is just unfurling, uninterrupted, as a reverie might in the mind. And so this is a good example of how poetry works upon our unconscious when we're reading it, and how it, it draws the sense in our experience out, taking us from one place to another. There's a movement going on, being traced here. And part of this syntactical, uninterrupted stray is coming from John Milton's Il Penseroso, She's very much wearing the mantle of Milton here when she's writing this way. Ah, and this is just beautiful. When darkened groans their softest shadows wear, delicate personification, the dark woods are, are wearing shadows like one would wear a piece of clothing or habit. And falling waters, we distinctly hear. Oh, now we have the introduction of not a lyrical I, a singular personal pronoun, no, but a plural one. And so this plural we, who is this we? It's very suggestive and we almost miss it. We don't really stumble upon it as we're reading, but it, it invokes a kind of community with the poet herself and with the reader, or perhaps the company with whom she's sharing this reverie. I think she's bringing us in. This is a role offered to the reader, as many poems are. When through the gloom more venerable shows some ancient fabric, awful in repose. Awful meaning not terrible in a negative sense, but full of awe, reposing. Again, delicate personification here. The sunburnt hills, the landscape is this ancient fabric. Their swarthy looks conceal, and swelling haycocks thicken up the veil. And she's so tender with her portrayal of animal life. Here we have this horse. When the loosed horse now, as his pasture leads, comes slowly grazing through the adjoining meads, whose stealing pace and lengthened shade we fear, there's that we again, till torn up forage in his teeth we hear. Just the, the delicate intimacy of that description. The horse is approaching, the shadow is fearful, they don't know what it is, it startles them, and then they hear the torn up forage in the teeth of the grazing horse. And if you've ever heard that the sound of, of horse or cow teeth tearing up the grass, it's got this, this, this texture, this texture very similar to the T's and the F's throughout, and this TH, till torn up forage in his teeth we hear. This is, this is brand new in poetry. In pastoral poetry, I don't think that there's a precedence for this, the sound of a horse chewing. It's not in Virgil's pastoral poetry, and I think this is something new in English poetry. Um, Alexander Pope, when he celebrates Windsor Forest in his panegyric of that name, he'll mention things like the whirring pheasant as it's startled from its hiding place. That's new. And, and, but this is, this is certainly new as well. There's this realistic credibility in these lines. And then, when nimbling sheep at large pursue their food, and unmolested kine rechew the cud. Notice how the night is a world in which the animal life is unmolested, unbothered. The grass begins to freshen up, the odors begin to rise, and uninterrupted stray. The horse is foraging freely at his will, the sheep are at large, the kine or the cow are unmolested, they're allowed to chew the cud, and so this, this night space, this reverie in which the mind is wondering, not following a train of logical thought, but just at will with the senses and in reflexivity with the landscape, uh, the night is becoming this space for the daydream, for the night dream, this nocturnal reverie. 
So we've got the animal life, the horse, the sheep, the kine, the birds, when curlews cry beneath the village walls, and to her straggling brood the partridge calls. Their short-lived jubilee the creatures keep. Of course, it harkens back to the book of Leviticus in which the, the year of jubilee was when f slaves were freed, when debts were canceled. Uh, it happened every 50 years, I believe. But here, the night itself is this time of jubilee, this time of freedom that the animals, the creatures, keep. And of course, creatures, instead of saying animals, besides fitting metrically better, goes back to uh, the origin of the creatures. They are created, creatures. Keep, but which endures. Again, we have this creatures and endures the internal sounds. Whilst tyrant man does sleep. It's not really the day that has repelled all of this freedom. It's this presence of humanity. It's the tyrant man. And this does have political valence for Anne Finch, who at this time is basically an outcast from court because she supported James II, the Catholic king, which was then basically forced to renounce his throne to William of Orange. Um, that's all some of the political background of, of Anne Finch's moment. But here we go. We still haven't gotten the main verb yet. She's still piling on these dependent clauses. When, when, when a sedate content the spirit feels, and no fierce light disturbs whilst it reveals, but silent musings urge the mind to seek something too high for syllables to speak. The reverie is leading the mind in silent musings toward a theological speculation, perhaps, a philosophical speculation, which must go unresolved in language. There's a certain humility here that's remarkable for the age of reason for this time, when it was so important to not only be able to express in language all that could be known, but also to convey it concisely. You look at Pope's poetry, his principles of criticism, Dryden, and Jonathan Swift, they're all very concise. But this reverie, unlike the analytical intellect, is leading on to a mystery. Till the free soul to a composedness charmed, finding the elements of rage disarmed. Now look at how she's been leading up to this, the grass, the odors, the animals, all free. Finally, the night is freeing the human soul and tranquilizing it into a composedness in which the harsher passions like rage are disarmed. Or all below, a solemn, quiet groan. Solemn, quiet groan. I do think that Thomas Gray internalized this when, he, when he'll write later in the 18th century. A solemn stillness holds save where the beetle wields his droning flight. And he'll, he'll take this. And so sometimes you'll hear echoes of Anne Finch in later poetry. Joys in the inferior world. What joys? The free soul. Joys in the inferior world. And thinks it like her own. So there's the free soul in the inferior world. That's the world of external nature. But the external nature is inferior, and the life of the mind, the psyche, is superior. But it's reflective, it's dialogic, this relationship with nature, and thinks it like her own. You think almost of Wordsworth's poem, There is a Boy, where you have the boy who stands on the cliffside hallooing to the owls across the lake, and the owls halloo back in response. There's this conversation going on between the mind, not really in words, but in feeling and sympathy. And here we have third use of this phrase. In such a night, let me abroad remain. We finally have the subject and verb that governs everything that came before. Circling perhaps back to the wanderer, this, this imagined figure at the beginning. Till morning breaks and all's confused again. So again, she's been setting up implicitly this contrast between the day in the free world of the night, which opens up this year of jubilee to the creatures and frees the soul into a quiet tranquility. But morning's going to come. It's going to change that. And this, this difference between night and day is something that you'll see in the Romantic poets, especially the Romantic poet Novalis, 
uh, the German poet. It's within this, this collective consciousness, within the institution of poetry, this idea that the night is associated with dreams, freedom, uh, expression, creativity perhaps, and that the morning is with busyness. You'll see John Donne complaining about the morning in several of his poems because the night for him is very erotic and the morning represents the disenchantment of that eroticism. Our cares, our toils, our clamors are renewed, or pleasures seldom reached, again pursued. Notice the a syndeton here, the absence of and, but, or, or. Uh, it's just piled on cares, toils, clamors. And again, she's using second person plural, our cares, implicating, I think, us too as the readers. Anne Finch is a good person to, to know in poetry. She's not often taught, but I thought she did deserve some treatment here. And some of that you'll discover as you go on to read more of her poetry for yourself. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching and until next time.